ST and let's get started. So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I'm Sugatri Koluru, Manager Emerging Technologies at the Digital Supply Chain Institute. This is our second session on women leading digital supply chains uh, transformations. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, this is an initiative through which we aim to inspire more women, advance careers in their supply chains and build a value community by sharing experiences and knowledge. So today, it is my pleasure to have Dean Hopkins, Vice President, Global Revenue Planning Under Armour, join me today for the fireside chat. Dean, welcome and thank you very much. Thank you, Sagathri. Great to be here. Absolutely. Uh, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, the duration of the session is going to be 30 minutes, in which Dean's going to share her stories and insights from her 10 plus years of a supply chain career. Uh, we have requested the attendees to submit the questions beforehand during the registration, so there will be no separate Q&A. Uh, for those of who, uh, you who submitted the questions, uh, thank you so much, and we will try our best to include most of them. So without further ado, let's get started. Dean, uh, so let's uh, set the stage for our audience. So can you tell us about Under Armour and a little bit about your current role, the scope and uh, breadth of the supply chain you're responsible for? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Under Armour is an athletic performance uh, apparel and footwear company. Um, we were founded in 1996 by Kevin Plank, who is a football player at the University of Maryland. And he had the idea to make amazing performance enhancing products for athletes. So upon his graduation from the University of Maryland, he founded Under Armour. And um, as such, our global headquarters are based here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Under Armour grew in, in popularity, the brand grew among athletes. Um, so by 2005, um, again, founded in 1996, by 2005, we made our IPO. Um, that actually happened to be the year that I joined Under Armour. Um, so I had kind of started when, it's, when it became a, a big company, I would say, or, or at least the, the, on the small end of a big company. Um, that year, we did about $250 million in revenues. Um, so from that point, we continued to grow domestically and also expanded internationally um, to the point that last year we did $5.3 billion in revenues. Um, tremendous growth um, that I'm certainly grateful to have been a part of. Uh, my role specifically right now is uh, leader of global planning, and that consists of demand forecasting, as well as inventory management, and managing our enterprise-wide SNOP process. Um, within the planning aspect, um, our teams forecast, they, they project demand across our whole product line. We offer about um, 15,000 items per year. Um, so those teams are forecasting not just how much of, of each product, but also where it needs to be. We have 18 different inventory locations globally, um, as well as when it needs to be there, what, what month out there in the future. So um, as you can imagine, a ton of data involved in those projections and, and a ton of um, advanced analytics involved. Um, with respect to inventory management, those demand forecasts ultimately get procured um, as finished goods production through our supply chain. Um, so that, needless to say, <laughs> generates a lot of inventory. And inventory is our largest utilization of cash. So it's really important that we maintain responsible inventory levels relative to um, what we intend to, to uh, generate as revenues. Um, and then lastly, the, the sales and operations process, the SNOP process, is really a um, cross-functional operating rhythm um, that repeats itself on a monthly basis. And it's through that that we orchestrate our planning cycle, our buying cycle, and then monitoring of KPIs um, that tell us how we're doing um, and also if any action is needed. Um, the SNOP cycle culminates on a monthly basis with an executive SNOP, the ESNOP meeting, where we present to our top leaders Again, the key KPIs, as well as any decisions that we're looking for them to, to drive our action into the next cycle. Wow, that's amazing. And looking forward to hearing uh, more of your thoughts on how you're managing this inventory and demand planning uh, as we proceed to the session. Okay, uh, so next question is, after your MBA, you joined UA in a sales role, right? But later you transitioned into demand planning. Tell us why demand planning and revenue planning and how all that led you to choose supply chains over other departments. 
Yes, I, I love that you asked this question, Sagathri, as if I had a focused career path in mind. I, I really didn't. Um, I've certainly followed an, an organic unfolding um, of my career. Um, in fact, as I mentor others um, who are looking to develop and grow their career path, I often make the recommendation um, not necessarily to focus on a particular role or a particular level that you're trying to get to, but rather focus on the impact that you're trying to make and and ultimately what you're trying to contribute every day. Um, I, I feel like that's what I've been doing is focusing on what are the needs of the organization and how can I best deliver them? And ultimately through that, the next opportunity becomes available. Um, but starting in the early years, I actually came into Under Armour right after my undergrad degree. And it was during the first few years while working that I did um, an MBA program in the evening part-time. Um, but I started in a customer service role, um, which is an entry level position within the sales organization. Um, and I'd say that that was really my first uh, exposure to supply chain. I was actually doing customer service for some of our big wholesale customers like Dick Sporting Goods. And at the time, um, the Sports Authority was a big customer of ours uh, here in, in the US. And um, it, as part of my role, I would be monitoring inbound working process inventory from our factories and looking to apply it and allocate it to those customer orders and then drop them down to our distribution facilities to be picked and, and shipped out. So it definitely had a flavor of, of, of supply chain involved as well as a lot of problem solving and root cause analysis to be able to connect the dots of where's my supply, where's the demand. Um, and I, I noticed through that, I had kind of a natural affinity towards that analysis. I recognized through that work that I was an analytical um, person and as did my leaders. So that ultimately led to my next experience, which was I was, I was invited to come help uh, create this and, and build this department called planning. We didn't have planning at the time. This is 2006. Um, at, prior to that, we had our sales team, our, our, our sales force, building the forecast for what we should buy. And I'm sure many of those who are joining this call can understand why that's not a best practice. Um, so it, at that point, we decided we're going to get some, some uh, analysts together who can really monitor our sales history and build um, an efficient level of inventory. Um, so really, that's where I've been ever since. It's been 14 years in planning. I can hardly believe it. But as I mentioned, with that rapid growth that we've experienced during that time, there's never been a dull moment. Um, we've expanded to new geographies, had new product lines. Um, and so it's been a continuous challenge. Um, but as I said, you know, I've kind of just maintained focus on my impact and what does the company need um, and how can I best uh, deliver? And that has ultimately allowed me to, to grow within the field. Um, and then I, I also want to add, since this is a women in supply chain forum, I can't talk about this development of my, of my uh, professional life without talking about a little bit of my personal life, my family life, my love life. Um, when I joined UA in that entry level role, you know, single, young, professional, wound up meeting my husband and ultimately marrying my husband who came with two sons of his own who became my, my stepsons or my bonus sons. Um, and then we have ultimately had two daughters together as well. So now working mom, um, you know, have, have a nice blended family, lot, a lot going on um, and loving every minute. Awesome. Such a great story and a great tip, uh, you know, focus on the impact you make and not on the role. And I'm sure uh, most of our audience could relate well to that. Okay. Um, so, you know, you, you touched upon a little bit about saying, you know, there's no never a dull moment in the UN. It's almost been 14 years you're with Under Armour now. So tell us uh, what has been the most energizing aspect of uh, being part of the UA supply chain team thus far? Yep. Um, you know, over those 15 years, um, we've had something like a 20% CAGR <laughs> across 15 years, and some years were 25 and 40% growth. Um, so we had a massive expansion, particularly in those first 10 years of my time with UA. Um, we had a, a get big fast strategy, and we needed to because ultimately we found ourselves as a global player um, competing against the, the big uh, names and brands in sport. Um, and, you know, I'd say within the last five years, that explosive growth has tapered a bit. 
fit, um, which has been a, a great opportunity because our leader, Kevin Plank, recognized that, you know, through that wild ride of growth, we did not build the, the scalable processes and discipline within our organization that were needed to then drive the next, you know, um, 10, 15 years of growth. So for the last five years, we've really been focusing on um, stabilizing the organization, driving discipline in our processes. As part of that, Kevin invited um, our new leader, Patrick Frisk, into the organization in 2017 as chief operating officer. And at that point, immediately, Patrick, you know, he's an operator and he introduced this new mindset and culture around discipline and calendar adherence and, um, you know, just managing our profitability, not just our top line growth. Um, and in the beginning of this year, in 2020, uh, Patrick actually became CEO. He took over um, that role from our founder, Kevin Plank. Um, so again, just of those 15 years of, of growth and, and um, just incredible experiences, Sugathri, when you ask me what's been the most energizing, it's actually been the last three years to see this transformation of our organization. I personally am very operationally oriented. Um, so this was music to my ears uh, that we were actually going to, to pay attention to how we could just refine our processes. And the most gratifying part is seeing the results. Um, so I mentioned, you know, we run this ES and OP process, which in and of itself, that process has, has improved throughout these years. But the best part is that when we monitor our KPIs, whether it be service, margin, inventory, we're seeing the results of this new focused discipline. And that's absolutely been the most rewarding for me. Awesome. Thanks, Jean, for sharing that. So let's uh, slightly change the subjects here. Um, all, you know, for the past few months, supply chains have been the hot topic because of the COVID pandemic. Um, so I'm sure uh, you've faced a lot of challenges over the last nine months. So can you talk a little bit about what's changed for you uh, over this period and what challenges you've faced? Yes, and I think anyone can attest, everyone, <laughs> everyone on earth can attest that this has been um, an unparalleled experience this year. Um, the journey through the year was so dynamic. Um, you know, when, when we when we were in January timeframe and we could see the virus um, spreading in, in China and the Asia region. For us, you know, we certainly have, have a, a, a commercial business in Asia, which was a concern, but we also have, you know, our vendors that are producing our products. We have a large presence in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so for us, our, our biggest concern at that point was the supply issue, um, seeing, you know, and, and understanding what was going to happen uh, to our business throughout the, the latter part of the year when our factories who were building our back half inventory were closing um, due to COVID restrictions. So the early reaction phase was um, how can we mitigate our supply chain so and, and really preserve our revenues for the year. Um, so we were looking at things like, you know, air freighting product um, as opposed to sending it through through ocean freight um, and, you know, determining how we could work with our customers to be more flexib flexible in um, their expectations as well. But then only a short time later in about the February timeframe where this became evident that it was a global pandemic um, and it was no longer just a su supply chain crisis, but it was a demand crisis as well. Um, so, you know, what will happen to our consumer demand when folks are no longer leaving their home and, and stores are closed? Um, so it created a, a different set of reaction in terms of not just we're trying to preserve our revenue, but we now need to manage all this excess inventory that we've ordered that may not find a home um, for consumers. So it, just unbelievable, um, you know, whiplash in terms of reactions and, and um, changes in approach. Um, we were concerned about revenue, of course. We were concerned about excess inventory. Um, I mentioned to you that, you know, we were thinking, let's air freight product to get it here to, to make up that time. Well, then as um, carrier flights were starting to cancel, as, as all that activity started to cancel, air freight rates, the capacity was reduced and the rates went up tremendously, like 5X the normal rate. So then we were thinking, okay, don't air freight, don't air freight. Um, so that was tremendous. And then, you know, 
unbelievably what we saw when we started getting into the June, July timeframe, once everyone kind of understood how to live and, and work remotely and, and what's their new way of working out, we actually saw an, an amazing bounce back um, to our business. Um, and, and consumers found us, you know, maybe not in the retail stores, but through our direct to consumer online business. Um, and with a lot of working from home, you know, folks want to be want to be comfortable and they want to feel um, active. So um, that was kind of a, a, a wonderful silver lining as well, is that we were still able to find the hearts of consumers. Um, but yet again, that resurgence of demand created another um, need for us to just quickly respond and um, read and react uh, uh, in, in the best way. So just tremendous dynamic changes and, and urgency required throughout the year. For sure. Yeah, I can imagine uh, this sheer amount of uh, changes, you know, you've made to your supply chain strategies, both on the supply side, as well as the demand side. But you know, do you see a significant shift because of all this which have happened over the past nine months? Do you see a significant shift to moving into more of a near shore manufacturing or near shore strategies? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we were already moving in that direction as an organization. Um, we have a very visionary leadership in that sense in terms of um, shortening the supply chain and tightening the supply chain, identifying any buffering points and just eliminating them so that you can better um, absorb rapid shifts in demand. So we were already down that path, but I'd say that this experience from 2020 has just allowed us to double down on it. Um, so for sure, um, nearshoring and VMI, and then also um, you know, making investments in machine learning and demand sensing to drive our demand forecasting so that we're just better at planning. I mean, I think that if, if anything, 2020 has has taught us that the last five days of history are much more relevant than you know the last year of history. And that's really what machine learning and, and demand sensing picks up on is that intricacy of the more recent history um, and it allows you to, to project accordingly. Perfect, I think that's a perfect segue into my next question to you as well. So can you talk a little bit about the technology, you mentioned ML, uh, but any other emerging technology you've been using to help get you a through these volatile months of supply chain? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I think technology has been really important, but I also don't want to underestimate the importance of our, um, our people and our processes that we had to leverage through this time. I think, I mean, it's the old faithful. It's um, that's, we were able to leverage our technology along with our um, you know processes and 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 our team structure and collaboration to really um, respond in the best way. So you know I mentioned that ESNOP process and that's a monthly repeating rhythm and it's it's you know one that we've been working on and driving an effectiveness towards. Um, and it was through that forum in the very beginning that our leader when, when they saw what was coming in, they were able to articulate to us what our key objective was, you know, and, and really make that clear. And I think that was so key to be able to articulate that up front because it allowed all the teams underneath them to know exactly what we were trying to accomplish. It would, it would have been very easy to get confused. Am I looking to preserve my revenue? Am I trying to improve my margin, my inventory? They made it very clear what the expectations are. With that expectation, we then formulated a, um, a task force, so to speak, and we called it Project Buffalo. And the reason we called it Project Buffalo, we've made the buffalo our, um, our, our totem animal, our spirit animal within Under Armour. And the reason that we do that, if, um, if you read up on the buffalo, compared to say a cow or a bull, when confronted with a storm, a buffalo puts his head down and charges right through. Whereas cow, cattle, bulls, they retreat from the storm. So by retreating from the storm, the storm's coming no matter what, you're just prolonging your time in the storm. Whereas if you plow directly into the storm, you get through it much more quickly. So that's the mindset that we took and we, we dubbed this task force Project Buffalo. It was a cross-functional group. We met daily for probably the first four months. We were meeting on a daily basis. And that's where we were leveraging the technology, Suga3. So we had invested 
prior to COVID, thankfully, we had invested in um, the capability around dashboards, real time or near real time dashboards and reporting around um, any you know timing slips from our vendor base, any slippage from our, our customer order book, um, and bringing all that together into a, a dashboard. You know, again, near real time reporting allowed us to come in on a daily basis and with all those dynamic changes get a sense of what was changing and most importantly, decide what we were going to do and, and drive the quick action. So I think the combination of the investment in that data analytics dashboarding, um, the, the um, operations around Project Buffalo meetings, feeding up through the SNOP forum, and then generally just you know our, our people and the collaborative um, mindset that we all shared through that time is what really made a difference. Awesome. Good to know about the Project Buffalo. It's interesting. Um, uh, uh, Dean, uh, you mentioned slightly about, you know, how all this team, this cross-functional team comes together in identifying the key objectives. Then, you know, at DSCI also, we have a similar approach in the sense we are ask our clients to focus on the proof of value rather than the proof of concept for any projects, you know, right. especially with emerging technologies. Yeah. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about you know, in general, how do you keep your company moving forward and decide which technologies uh, to in invest in? You know, you have a lot of options these days yeah. and a sure. lot of emerging technologies. Yeah. Um, you know, what I mentioned about our leaders articulating the, the objective up front, I think mm -hmm. that's so critical is to know what your company's strategy is and what the main objective is you can't expect technology to do it for you, you know? So if you have that in mind, then you can select the right technology that's going to support it. So I think that's step number one before you start looking and shopping around for technologies is over overarching. What are you trying to accomplish as an organization? Beyond that, I think it's very important to stay current, um, whether you're shopping around or not, but stay current on the technologies that are out there. Um, and I will, give you a plug with, with Digital Supply Chain Institute, um, the, the research that you do and the white papers that you put out are a perfect example. Um, they're made available and it, and it really allows you to apply and, and think about applying um, new technologies to your own business to start thinking about, you know, if that's something that you'd like to pursue. So, so we've certainly got gotten value from that. Um, and then the other thing that, that I found, um, benefit from is before you make that investment, um, you know, assuming you're not the first mover, go find people who have already um, adopted the solution prior to you. Um, I wouldn't necessarily just take the, the, the software company word for it, you know, go find um, a, a test case, get a testimony of, you know, how was the implementation process? How quickly were you able to, to utilize the functionality? And in general, are you happy with, with the result that you've gotten? I think that's really important before you make such a, you know, oftentimes costly investment. Perfect. Thank you, Reen. Okay, um, uh, change, changing the subjects a little bit again here, uh, more of reflections. Let's talk about uh, reflections. Uh, from the work you've done in the past few months. Mm -hmm. um, as you reflect upon your reactions uh, to demand planning or you know, revenue planning, how have you built resilience and flexibility into your supply chains? Uh, what have been the outcomes and uh, what were the lessons learned? Yeah, I'm, I think what probably the biggest um, takeaway from this year is thinking about our supply chain holistically um, with truly an end-to-end -end enterprise mindset, you know, we've got different subcomponents of supply chain and I'm, I'm one of them and demand planning, but then you have supply planning and sourcing and logistics and distribution. And what's right for one of those components is not necessarily right for the, the total at large. Um, and we had to strip away that thought process of, you know, how, what's going to impact my, own department's KPIs and think more of, you know, we're, this is it, we're in survival mode. So we truly need to collaborate and think um, bigger picture. And the benefit that we saw through that, that was really driven through urgency, uh, we're, we're fully planning to, to take along with us into our standard ways of working and, and thinking and evaluating our business processes more from a complete supply chain angle. 
Right. And uh, if I may build on that, so what are the leadership skills and strengths which help you, you know, um, achieve this, you know, uh, sure. manage and what advice do you have for our audience and for other supply chain professionals to succeed in their supply chain journey? Yeah, well, I, you know, I've hit this one a few times, but that very clear um, strategy and objective articulated from leadership is so key. I mean, it just makes everyone's lives so much easier. And it also drives the results that you need if everybody's fully aligned to that business objective. So we've, again, we've, I can't speak highly enough for my senior leaders for um, the, the work that they do there in making it very clear for us what we're looking to achieve. Um, the other thing that I think has become really apparent this year, and this is why, you know, when, when thinking about women in leadership, this is why I think there's so much value to really balance the scale there, is, um, is leading from a place of empathy with teammates. Um, and if you think about, like, we've gone through some very dark times this year, um, a global health crisis, a financial crisis. Um, we've seen, you know, our company, or excuse me, our country torn apart politically. We've had, um, you know, we've witnessed the pain of social injustice in our, in our country. Um, and, you know, our teammates are really ho holding all of this on their shoulders. It's, it's very difficult on top of, you know, doing remote work for the first time ever on top of have many times, you know, having to homeschool children, um, unbelievable challenges. And I think the empathy, you know, what I tried to do this year is just lead from, from my heart, show my vulnerability as a human as well, and invite my teams to come bring their whole selves to work, bring their vulnerable selves to work. Um, and I believe that, you know, in doing that, they, it just helps ease the burden a little bit, knowing that, you know, we're all in the same boat. It's okay if you need to step away to, to get your kid's class Zoom started. Um, I, I feel like it just alleviates a little bit of, of tension. And when folks can come to work as their complete selves, ultimately they're gonna be more fulfilled and they're gonna be more productive. Um, and then one last thing um, that I would mention in terms of um, leadership qualities, especially in times of crisis, one of our key values, we have five key values at Under Armour and one of them is celebrate the wins, um, which is you know certainly easy to overlook because of how busy we are. But in a time like COVID and through Project Buffalo, we really took time to celebrate the win. So when we were looking at you know, a scorecard that looked abysmal and maybe next week it looked a little less than abysmal, we took time to celebrate that win and energize the team so that they could continue to push forward for that next um, incremental gain. Awesome. And you know, given all these experiences and lessons you, uh, you know, took away from Under Armour, what do you advise for other organizations and companies, you know, especially around people, you know, you, 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 you emphasized a lot on how important people are, especially, right? And, you know, their role they played in, especially in the volatile months. So why should companies, you know, or what should companies do in order to address the low number of women in supply chains and the gender gap issue in general? And what steps can be taken to correct this imbalance yeah, um, you know, I think supply chain is, is certainly in need of um, fostering growth of, of women and, and the development in, into leadership roles and business in general, you know, it's, it's certainly lacking. Um, but we know the value, there's a ton of research that's been done on this. We know the value of building diverse teams. Um, homogenous, homogenous teams will lead to homogenous uh, solutions. You know, if you have a, a team with this similar traits and characteristics and backgrounds, they're generally gonna think the same way and approach problems the same way. But when you can come from a multifaceted angle, that's when you're really gonna create the best, most robust solutions. Um, and this is, as, as I mentioned, you know, very much observed through, through data. Um, so I think it's important that when you're evaluating candidates to grow your team, that you consider what, each candidate brings to the diversity of your team, you know, right up there with what they bring in terms of years of experience or, or education level. It's it's that critical to drive, um, you know, productivity and um, and innovation among your team. And then I think at leadership levels, it's especially important. Um, I think you know, men and women think differently from each other. One is from Mars, one is from Venus. So you know, bring them together, and that's where you create a nice, well balanced culture. Um, and it's really important for, for folks at lower levels in the organization to, 
to see people at the higher level that they that they assimilate with because it allows them you know to aspire to that to that level and and continue to to develop so i can't say enough um, about the importance of fostering this in the organization um, i do have some stats speaking of the research that i wanted to share um, McKinsey and leanin.org have done an annual report of women in the workplace for the last five years. So they just published their 2020 report. Um, and I have some stats here. So senior level women are more likely than senior level men to embrace employee friendly policies and programs and to champion racial gender, uh, racial and gender diversity. Over 50% of senior level women say they consistently take a public stand for gender and racial equality compared to roughly 40% of senior level men. 38% 30 per, uh, of senior level women currently mentor or sponsor one or more women of color compared to 23% of senior level men. Um, and then when women are well represented at the top of their, um, at the top, companies are 50% more likely to outperform their peers. So. Diversity drives innovation. Um, see it over and over in the research. Um, this is definitely something that companies should be paying attention to and investing in. I think that's a perfect note to end with. Diversity drives innovation. Um, so with that, I think we are at the top of the hour. I want to say thank you to Dean for sharing your knowledge, stories, and experiences. It is you know, time has passed so quick, you know, I wish we have 30 more minutes, but I think it's enlightening and insp ins inspiring. And I'm sure our attendees are walking away with the same experience as well. Um, to all the attendees, uh, you will be receiving a short survey right after this. Your feedback is very important and valuable for us uh, in order to design the future course of the initiative. So please take a minute and let us know how you like the session and a new format. Uh, just like you have heard today, we have amazing speakers lined up for you in 2021. So stay tuned. Happy holidays and see you all in the next session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dean. Thanks, Agathe.